Hello viewers. In this video, I shall try to uh, talk about an autobiographical as well as a travel writing. That is, may you be the mother of a hundred sons, a journey among the women of India. This book is written by Elizabeth Bumiller and she is a Washington reporter for the New York Times. Besides, she was also a Times White House correspondent from September 10, 2001 to 2006. Apart from that, she was also the author of May You Be the Mother of a Hundred Sons, A Journey Among the Women of India and the Secrets of Mariko, A Year in the Life of a Japanese Woman and Her Family. Bumiller, she had lived in the Washington, D.C. area with her husband, Stephen R. Wiseman, and two children. So without any delay, now let's uh, dive in into the summary of this uh, book. Through this book, the writer has tried to depict the typical Indian woman representing about 75% of the 400 million women and female children in India a as a victim of poverty, repression, illiteracy, and other kinds of material and spiritual deprivation. As for the employed woman, her other full-time job, the care of the house and the children, it was not made easier by her typical husband's failure to help her or even to acknowledge that what she did at home was work. So through this work, she has also tried to depict the typical Indian household where uh, husband or where the male counterpart, they are in the dominance and they are the patriarch figure. And... Uh, through this work, she has also tried to depict her pers perspective about India and about women of India. Uh, now, I would like to explore the uh, main content of the story. Okay, here. Okay, here. This book is a story of an American woman's journey into what for her was unknown world. So Indian society, India, uh, if we talk specifically, that was the uh, that was utterly unknown world for him, uh, for her, sorry, and the lives of the women of India that was diametrically unknown or or to the unfamiliar to the writer. But it lasted almost four years. She lived in India and she had also taken uh, to the most of the states of India and she has also explored the thousands years of Indian history. Here she said. Uh, that she met and interviewed hundreds of women, although she was not sure that this number of uh, people meant anything. Mm -hmm. But she uh, mentioned that she had learned the most from the handful of Indian women, and she had counted them as friends and from the larger truths that came from the exploration of individual lives. Moreover, many of the Indian women she encountered led miserable ag existences, little better than those of beast of burden. And others were among the most formidable people she had ever met. And almost all of them were quite inspiring for her. So we all know in our India, women had to struggle a lot. So she had been here for four years. So she had seen almost every um, uh, part of Indian women's life. The story of Indian women, it is ancient, but it is also the story of the profound change and contradictions of the present day. She has also mentioned in the chapter one that her husband and she first landed in New Delhi in the middle of a January night in 1985. And at the time, it seemed as if they had flown the 19th hours from their home in Washington, D.C. to a country that could not be a part of the same planet. So we all know, uh, I don't have to reiterate here, but still, uh, India and U.S., it is almost the uh, two sides of one coin. Their culture is different. Their uh, belief system is different and when she had arrived in India at that time she had uh, downrightly felt it so that thing she had tried to picturize through this narrative and one of New Delhi's su sudden winter sudden winter fox it hung heavy over the runaway according to her as she had uh, depicted and it was obscuring what little there was to see other than scrub and rocky soil later she had uh, stated that she had always thought it fitting that her first view of India should have extended no more than 25 feet in front of her. Then she says that she was 28 years old and she had traveled no farther from the United States than Europe. And to prepare for 
India. She had dutifully read the recommended books and talked to numerous old Indian hands, like The Jewel in the Crown, the public television series based on Paul Scott's Raj Quarter, and it was bringing uh, magical scenes of Kashmir's Dal Lake and the Golden Desert of Rajasthan into American living rooms at the time. And she had been moved by the film Gandhi. We all know that was a Oscar winner uh, a few years before. Uh, but none of that seemed to have anything to do with the India she had first en encountered. So we all know um, fact and fiction, whatever the things that are portrayed by printed books or by uh, online or so social media or any kind of media where uh, some uh, uh, issues of India is depicted. So that will ne never be a uh, whole reality for the complete India. So that's the thing she is trying to say here, that whatever she had seen in the films like Gandhi and in a um, TV series like, uh, what, what are the series? Yes, the jewel in the crown, that thing. But that had not really helped her to understand the uh, country called India, according to her. Okay. That is the same thing in our pra pra pragmatic life too. When uh, we uh, hear some some something in the um, newspaper or from the news, but when we visit that place, in reality, that is too utterly different. So the same thing the writer is experiencing here. And she had said that none of that seemed to have had anything to do with the India and uh, India that she first encountered and no book or no person could have described the physical sensation of simply breathing the air. And this was before the completion of the modern Indira Gandhi International Airport. So their arrival was not sanitized by a sealed walkaway in the brightly uh, lit tar terminal. Instead, they st stepped out the door of the plane and they were instantly assaulted by the overpowering smell of a Delhi winter night, smoky and sweet and overripe and utterly foreign. And it was with a promise of ad adventures to come. Later, she had discovered that the odor was from the smoke of the cow dung fires that people built to cook food and kept warm. So in US, uh, all pe people, they use gas, right? Like LPG gas and many other natural gases for their cooking. And nowadays they use electronic things. But when she arrived in India and when she had experience of Indian way of living or cooking things, that was utterly different for her. So she's saying that she had, for the first time, she had, uh, she had been witnessing about the uh, smoke of the cow dung and how people are from that uh, cow dung or from that dry cow dung, how they are cooking food and keeping uh, those foods warm. So that thing has really fascinated her. And she's saying, I was shaking as I walked down the steps and onto the tarmac, feeling like an innocent unworthy of what was before her. As she, or as they waited under the belly of the plane for a rattle trap bus to to them to the terminal she started through the mist at the arabic letters on a park 747 that had arrived that night from the gulf and they had flown over saudi arabia on their way and it took her a moment to readjust to a new place in her own world the middle east uh, was now west for her and the fog the, the fog and her fatigue that gave everything an uh, amorphous kind of dreamlike quality, as if India had no edges and no point of penetration for her. And it was the first of many, many times she would feel as if she were free falling in space with nothing to hang on to and no point of reference. Furthermore, she uh, goes on by saying that she had come to India because of her husband. And she still did not like to say it that way, but it was one reason. And she thought that she wrote this particular book about India instead of another. And for the past five and a half and a half years, she had been a reporter for the Style Saxon of the Washington Post and Steve, her husband, had covered the White House for the New York Times. And they were married in 1983. And a little more than a year later, Steve uh, joined the foreign staff of the Times and accepted New Delhi as his first assignment. Then she saying, she knew almost nothing about India and her father had spent three months there in 1956 while making a film about traveling by a jeep around the world. And the image she had of the country to the extent that she had even thought about it had come chiefly from one scene in the film that had stayed with her for years. It was of Hindu worshippers on the betting ghats or steps leading into the waters of the Gangas at Banaras, one of the only cities of India. And people swarmed into the river gulp mouthfuls of fatted brown water and stood knee deep in silent meditation as they 
cupped their hands in prayer toward the sun. Then the sot had a beautiful amber light, which she uh, then recognized or now rec- recognized as the color of dawn on the g- Gangas. But it all looked so inaccessible to her new world. So that's it. I have just tried to uh, present here a very tiny detail about the uh, about this book. Thank you so much.